Hey, everybody, we're going to pick up our conversation we started last week. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back and listen to that episode, and then you can listen to this episode. This is part two of a two-part series. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Welcome to The Friday Habit with Mark Labriola and Benjamin Manley. The Friday Habit is for small business owners, freelancers, and creatives who are ready to take their business to the next level. Join us as we discover how to apply the strategies we learn to grow our businesses, make more money, and live every day like it's Friday. We all find meaning in doing something that we're passionate about, but sometimes we sacrifice what we're passionate about so that we can make a buck or do something we think will make a buck. Um, and, and you hear it time and time again, it's just like, you know, pursue your dreams or, you know, follow your passion. And uh, it's just, sometimes it's just scary. So it's encouraging to hear that, uh, you know, from someone who said, yeah, just, you, you got to do it. You got to put the work in and then just follow your passion. It's a good formula for success. The other advantage is if you're doing something you love, you can't lose. Mm -hmm. You know, writing is a hobby. I, my sister loves to knit. My mom likes to paint. I love to garden. But people who have those hobbies rarely think like, I'm going to end up making a lot of money and being famous for this. They're just hobbies that people enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. The unusual thing about like writing, playing an instrument, uh, making a movie is because it's so commercial and there are people out there making a lot of money doing it. It's hard to do those hobbies without having the dream as well. And I, mm -hmm. I think the only healthy way to pursue these kinds of creative fields is to make sure you don't lose the hobby side of it. Make sure you're doing it because you love it, that you would choose to do it even if it costs you money. And mm -hmm. to me, that was the attitude I brought into it. I think it's healthier than, okay, this is something that's a hobby, but I'm not going to be happy until someone pays me for it. Like that is self-defeating i think to have that attitude mm. yeah that that's really i feel like that's really helpful because it even makes me think about that idea of like when you have this peak experience of hitting a goal or hitting what your goal is and then oh wow that was really successful and then it's not that pressure on yourself like now what how do i beat that success it seems like with your mindset and approach you don't it probably, I mean, you, you know, I'd be curious to see how you feel about that after having that success. Did you have more pressure on yourself? But it seems like if your attitude is, well, Hey, that's awesome. That happened. It was a side effect of me doing what I love. Let me keep doing what I love. And that's the real purpose is that creative process and getting these ideas out there more than the money. And yeah, has that mindset helped you with that kind of uh, effect of like, wow, that was successful. Now there's pressure to, to do it again. Yeah. Two things. I, one of the things I, I did deliberately was I kept subverting expectations. So whatever I had done that was very successful, like uh, with Wool, when I wrote Shift, it was a very different kind of story. I did not want to get trapped into repeating myself or, or being in a rut. And, and you know, I wrote, you know, a, a love story and I wrote a really gruesome zombie book and a uh, young adult space opera. And, I just didn't want to repeat myself because for me, the passion of like writing that first book was I was creating something brand new, just a new world and getting trapped writing uh, sequels or uh, the same kind of story would have been disastrous for my passion. But you asked if things got more difficult. The thing that got hard for me was when I was writing for myself, I wrote really loose and free and I took a lot of hmm. um, risks and I was super creative. And later when I had a million people like reading my books, I can almost feel like the eyeballs over my shoulder. Mm. And it was really <laughs> my inner critic was kind of, my, my inner critic was now on uh, steroids. Like it was amplifying all the imagined uh, voices of the people who were, who were expecting to read this. So once that started happening and it was a very brief, I only dealt with this for a very short period of time because once I realized that was happening, I was like, forget that. No, you don't even know if you're going to publish this. No one's going to read this. It's just for you. And once I, you know, after like two or three months of hating everything I was writing, I learned to hate it a normal amount, which every author should, you know, hate their writing <laughs> so, uh, somewhat. <laughs> but I, I got back to just writing 
like for myself. Yeah. Uh, who are some authors that you, you know, really like science fiction? I'm, I'm a huge fan of Isaac Asimov and, uh, you know, he, he, like listening to machine learning and all your little short stories just reminds me of like a lot of Isaac Asimov's short stories like iRobot and Bicentennial Man and like, you know, all those short stories that became, you know, decent movies later on. But, um, you know, who are, who are some authors that you were into? I know you mentioned Ender's Game, which is like one of my favorite um, books. My wife and I read that. Uh, we listened to it on an audio book driving through Texas. And it's like every time I think about that book, I remember that road trip that we like listened to it together on. And and then I let my kids listen to it. And I was thinking like, this is actually pretty brutal. Like <laughs> the story of these kids, you know, and it's, gruesome. it's really intense. Yeah. I'm like, man. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I was like, maybe I should have let my kids listen to this just yet. I love Peter F. Hamilton. He writes these huge sweeping space operas that are just some of the most inventive storytelling out there. Impossible to adapt probably, but his, his Neutronium Alchemist series is incredible. I've always loved Philip K. Dick. He just makes you question mm. reality and knows how to write a, a really tight, punchy short story. I grew up on the classics. I love the dystopian stuff like uh, mm-hmm. uh, 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, yeah. Handmaiden's Tale, like anything that Animal Farm, Gulliver's Travels, like all these things that were subversive and worked on multiple layers. But I, you know, once I started writing science fiction, I learned I had to start reading more nonfiction and learning mm. like what's, what's the frontiers of knowledge reading a lot of psychology and philosophy, um, a lot of history, like how are, how are we repeating these themes? Um, mostly to avoid stumbling upon a story in a way that I would want to explore it. Because if I knew it was already done, I would mm-hmm. never try it myself. So I started kind of avoiding my own genre in order to have more, more creative freedom. Yeah, that makes so much sense. You know, and then you know, bringing that up, you know, right now we're in this heightened sense of artificial intelligence and AI and uh, chat GPT. And we're, we're seeing all this stuff where my, my feed on YouTube is just constantly bombarded with, you know, the end of society as we know it. And Elon Musk saying it's like the scariest thing he could imagine. You know, what are your thoughts about the whole artificial intelligence and, you know, you being a science fiction writer and can dream and imagine uh, the the worst case scenarios, you know, when it comes to technology and how it can uh, overtake us? You know, what are your, your personal opinions and thoughts about uh, where you see things and, and where you see things going? Um, I think it's... I think it wouldn't take AI to create big problems. Like all it takes is uh, more technology and one bad individual. Like I don't think it's, we're going to have to get to sentience. If we have people able to do CRISPR at home, you know, DNA sequencing Mm -hmm. at home and people on message boards sharing code for human viruses rather than computer viruses. We're going to get to a really mm-hmm. weird territory. The thought experiment that I give people is, and I don't, I'm not sure I've even came up with this because it's been so long since I've been using it. And it sounds like something someone else probably said at some point, but the, the experiment is this. Some morning, everyone wakes up and there's a, there's a, they have a necklace around their neck and there's a button on the necklace. And the button says, if you push this, everyone on earth will die. And the, the question is, how long do we live? Everyone's as aware of the button at the exact same time. How long does humanity have? And I think the only sane answer is like half a second, maybe, or two tenths of a second. But I wouldn't give us a full second because there's someone out there who will push that button. And there's someone who will push it because they're, they can't not push buttons or they the idea of going with everyone else or someone pushing it after them or ahead of them. Like there's a million reasons to push that button and all it takes is one. Mm. And so the question for humanity, if everyone agrees that that's true, and I've never met anyone who said, who's never once as someone said, we'll last an hour, much less we'll all put the button down and never touch it. That's just inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Right? So then the question is, if we all agree, that's the, that's the answer. Then the next question is, what technology would equal that button? And 
if that is an inevitable technology, then we will go extinct. And it's difficult to come up with that technology. So that the next question is much trickier mm. because nuclear weapons are not powerful enough to wipe out humankind. Um, global warming right. is not powerful enough to wipe out humankind. Right now, the only thing we can think of is a really large meteor, which maybe not might not be enough, or the sun going nova, which is mm. five billion years away. But right. with 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 CRISPR and home printing technology, with nanotechnology, with maybe there's a world ending system out there, and AI, if it's not it, could point the way towards one and help someone develop it. So mm. is this apocalyptic? I think I think. Maybe yes, but not in the ways that Elon Musk, who knows almost nothing about artificial intelligence, thinks it is. It's going to be mm. in a way that we can't yet conceive of. Right. It's going to help us get to a different path. You know, I think AI has much greater chance of helping us solve big problems, clean energy, climate change, solving diseases, even curing, um, treating death as a disease. Lifting people out of poverty. Yeah, leaving mm. poverty. It's going to open up doors for so many people. Like, it, it's a great leveler. Like, you, ha- you used to have to learn to code to create the app that you wanted. And mm-hmm. now, once you can just tell, describe your app to a machine and the machine will make the app for you, then people all over the world who have great ideas but don't have access to education are going to become entrepreneurs. And we should celebrate that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, that, that seems like a... A dark positive answer, <laughs> if that's a thing. It's like dark comedy, <laughs> dark positivity. Well, like here's, so here's something else. Like we're all scared of like humans all dying, but that's the one thing that we know that humans will all do. Like, you know, there's like mm-hmm. 9 billion people on the planet. All 9 billion of them are going to die, you know, in less than 120 years, all 9 billion are going to die. And it's, it, we, we, we can know that and, and it doesn't freak us out, but when we think about them all dying at the same time, it like, it, it, it triggers something. So what we are really concerned about is humanity mm-hmm. surviving. We're not really concerned about individuals. And once we accept that, then we need to start thinking about how does humanity survive? It's not through individuals. It's going to be through our collective knowledge and our collective creativity. It's going to be, you know, the, strands of DNA is just markers of what we were. And AI is the solution for mm. immortality in that case, and not a not the harbinger of our destruction. There is no future in which this earth is habitable for an infinite number of years. That's just not how physics works. You know, the, the sun will run out of energy. Right. It will swell until it touches the earth. Forget about being here forever and forget about living on Mars. And forget about humans traveling to distant stars. It's inconceivable that we solve those problems. But it's not inconceivable that we create so many copies of a machine that houses our collective consciousness and we just sh- shoot them in every direction and they're solar powered and they're. I don't see the end of humanity with, I don't see humanity ending with technology. I see it really beginning with technology. Mm. Well then, where where do you think is that, there's is that, that line? <laughs> I love it. It's, it's super <laughs> yeah. interesting. Working on a new novel? No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where where do you think that line is though? Because at what point are we not human? Right? It, it, like with the, the idea of the singularity, right? Where where everything kind of comes together and we are able to live forever. We're able to. Um, you know, put neural links in our brain and be connected to the internet. We're able to replace our body parts and become robots. Like, I guess at some point the question is, is going to be, and, and Ben and I recently watched Ex Machina, you know, and we were talking about that idea of like, there's this robot, right. Who has a directive to survive and they figure out, okay, what do I have to do? Who do I have to manipulate in order to survive? And then, at what point is that not a a being, you know, or a, I don't even know how to articulate this idea or thought, but it's like, you know, at some point will humanity cease to exist, but, or it'll exist in a new way. Or merge with technology and then in a it, way or something. And merge with technology. And then it's like, are we human <laughs> then at that point? I, I don't know. Yeah. I, we're, we're at that point already. We were at that point 10 years ago or so. The, uh, the combination of Google and the internet and Wikipedia 
has made, you know, any, any furtherance of our existence bonus time because we've already, we've shut it down. And if we all just killed over right now and, uh, an alien race or the next thing to, to pop up through the, the, the soup that is the, the warm earth stumbled upon that, like there we are, we're still alive. We're our contributions to our, to culture and art and science and our philosophy. And it's all right there. And now that answer is hundred percent it's done. Like the fact that uh, you just have to give chat GPT access to the internet and you can ask it anything. You can have this conversation with that the three of us are having. You can emulate the three of us having that conversation. Mm -hmm. And this is the worst version of this AI you will ever see. Every year, every week, right. you're seeing the dumbest AI there will ever be. So when you hear people saying, you know, what AI can't do, they're probably already wrong um, before they finish the sentence. Like it's getting smarter so fast. So, right. you know, another hypothetical, if, if we all disappeared and what someone had was access to chat GPT for in the internet right now, how much of humanity would really be lost? Like not much. It could. It could recite every sonnet of Shakespeare. It could write an infinite number of new sonnets of Shakespeare. If it did an infinite number of them, then an infinite number of those better than any sonnet of Shakespeare. That's just math. And right. you know, humanity would, would, would continue to exist. And, and I think we need to think more about that in our collective transcendence and existence and stop focusing so much on the little monkey brain fear that we all have of dying individually, which is a guarantee. Hmm. Like, let's just get over that hmm. part because that's just going to happen. And let's stop <laughs> being sad about it too. It's the beauty of life that it ends, you know? Hmm. So it's almost like you're talking about not necessarily the biological continuation of humanity even, but almost like what legacy do we live or contribution in the universe almost? Like what are we contributing to that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're contributing a lot just by broadcasting things into the ether that could be picked up someday. Um, I think really getting hung up, like to me, is, is Shakespeare dead? I, I don't think so. Like we have a conversation with him and mm. about him all the time. We, um, people continue to reinterpret his works and to put them on. And all of us dream of having any kind of, of extended life the way so many of the great artists have had that, that are now gone. I think the people worrying about my content is being stolen to, to train AI, man, please let me be some part of that. Like, I, I think we should just <laughs> celebrate that our blog posts and our social media feeds and everything is we're going to live on forever as some small part of this, this prismatical. All right. You know, we're going to wrap things up here shortly, but if you had top, top three sci-fi movies that you'd say like, all right, these are my top three sci-fi movies. What are you picking? Okay, I'm I'm gonna go like kind of a little askew because I think people have some of this you know standard answers to this. I think Edge of Tomorrow is underrated. Ooh, oh, I love that movie. Let's hear let's hear yours first. All right, I'll give mine, and I want Ben to give his too. Okay, okay. So mine first are gonna be uh, Gattaca, Terminator Two, and The Matrix. Solid. Man, uh. That's so f funny you said Edge of Tomorrow because I've been talking. I like showed that to my kids just the other day, and I was like, "This is such a good movie." I was actually going to say that one too. Um, <laughs> anyway, and I don't know if I, I would say one of my other favorites it would be uh, A Quiet Place. I really love. I uh, I don't know if you call it sci-fi movie. I know it's more thriller, but I love the subtlety of it. Also, really love Signs. Um, so I'd say it probably Edge of Tomorrow, Signs, and uh, and uh, A Quiet Place probably be my, some of my favorites. Well, these are good. Yeah, I, I love science too. Um, I would say, yeah, Edge of Tomorrow, my, I think my favorite sci-fi movie, maybe of all time, because it, it encapsulates the genre itself, is Galaxy Quest. Um, I think that is a perfect script, and it's a ridiculous <laughs> yeah, that's cast. that's a good one. <laughs> yes. There's nothing I would change about that. It's beautiful. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I kind of, I really love sci-fi horror, so I know they're, they're probably too classic to to surprise anybody with, but Predator and Alien, both of those movies, I was just at the right age to like be blown away by them. 
Um, mm. But uh, even Starship Troopers, which is to me almost like a satire and comedy, but done so well. Um, and I yeah. just love campy stuff, like all the all the really campy stuff. I love too. <laughs> yeah, Mars attacks and and, and stuff <laughs> like that. Exactly. Yeah, the the horror sci fi. I'm torn because I hate horror, but I love sci fi. So like Prometheus is on that list of where it's like. Oh man, I love this movie because of all the concepts and then just the like intensity, you know, but then just when it crosses that line of horror, I, I'm just like, oh gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I eat that stuff up. So tell us a little bit about you getting the call to, and I'm, I'm assuming that it's been on the table for a while, right? Like, whoa, was so popular. I'm sure you probably had many talks with movie um, studios to make it into a movie or, or whatever. Like, wh- what was that? Now it's going to be on Apple Plus, Apple TV Plus. Like, what was that journey for you? Was it a, a kind of start and stop over the past several years, or or what? What did that look like? Yeah, it was a long. It's about a twelve year process. Um, it spent a long time with Ridley Scott and Twentieth Century Fox as a feature. Had a couple scripts, different directors attached. I kept asking, look, if we're not going to make it this year, can I get the rights back? It's, you never get those rights back, but I had a great relationship with these guys and they were Mm. really kind. And after they, you know, couldn't make it, uh, over the finish line several times, they, they let me have the rights back. And I went back out for TV because the world had changed a little bit. TV was a little, uh, better medium for a big story. And I did a deal with AMC and they had an amazing creative team and they weren't sure if they could make it because uh, it was going to be expensive. And Apple had, was after it so hard, but this, you know, the first time they approached me, Apple TV didn't even exist yet. And I decided NDA to even talk to them. Right. So, uh, by the time, uh, Apple came to AMC to, to partner up, it was obvious not only was Apple TV plus going to be an amazing, uh, streaming service, but some of the things they were doing were just so prestigious and, and well done. So I was like, let's do it. Let's, let's join forces. And so I had like all the best of the creative teams and the, the, um, the passion deep pockets and yeah, it, it, it sounds, I'm making it a really reader's digest version, but it was like mostly years of hearing nothing. Cause I didn't bug people about it. And when I would hear stuff, it was like, yeah, it's moving, it's moving. Hmm. And then during the pandemic, I just got an email, uh, and said, Hey, can you get on the phone? Got some news. And I was like, that's, I've never had that email before. <laughs> and uh got on the call and they're like we're gonna make we're gonna make this and uh that was the, the green light that started the whole process and started the sets being built and the you know the cast being assembled and it's just the last couple of years watching them uh film this and and put it together has been one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me it's just been a thrill to see how things are made and to watch your imagination become tangible Oh, that's so amazing. That's, I love that. That's just like, I'm sure too, like the kid in you just comes alive when you're like seeing all this stuff, like behind the curtain on all these things. You're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's crazy. I I did a day on set of being an extra and that was like really wild. Just pretending to be a character in your own, like playing cosplay basically for your own story. And, um, so if you keep a, keep a close eye out in episode 10, like I'm, I'm, towards the end of the episode i'm like in the crowd <laughs> not knowing how to okay. act yeah he's like the stan lee you know <laughs> in silo <laughs> exactly uh, was it hard to give up was it hard to give up some control uh i'm assuming that the screenplays and stuff were written by other people and and so you had to give up some control as far as how that goes like how, how much uh, involvement did you have when it comes to how they develop the story, what they cut from the story to make it fit and all those other kind of things. Yeah. I was, you know, lucky to be an executive producer and to be able to, you know, sit in on the writer's room and help block out the first, um, season and the first episode. And, uh, um, I was more the one trying to suggest going, you know, different from the book and they would keep pulling me back in. I think the, amazing showrunner we had on this Graham Yost was like, Hey, let's stick to the book. And I'd be like, but what if, what if it wasn't in a silo? You know, well, I was like doing the crazy stuff. The cool thing about doing TV is instead of cutting things out, we were actually being able to add stuff. So we were fleshing out parts of the book that were, mm. 
uh, hinted at, but we could, you know, make it bigger. My, one of my goals was I wanted people who've read the books to be surprised. I don't want them to know what's going to happen. So we didn't want to be a, a faithful adaptation mm -hmm. on every plot point. We just wanted the characters to be true to themselves. And, and that was more important than like, mm -hmm. we're not taking the book and okay, shoot this page and shoot that page and shoot that page. Never works that well. Yeah. Tell the best story for the medium possible. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, and I love that too, that it, it's a series because I think you'll uh, be able to allow to breathe better. You know, one of my favorite yeah. books um, is Ready Player One. And, uh, you know, I, I just love that story. And I connected so much to the video games and, and the movies and everything that they referenced and, and that he referenced in that book. And then I was so excited for the movie and then they had changed so much and they, they couldn't fit all the story the way that it was. So they had to cut tons of things out. And, and then it's just that classic, well, the book was better, you know? <laughs> so I, I'm, I am glad, although I could see an amazing, you know, movie off of this, off of the story, I think a series is going to let it breathe better. And, and who knows, you know, like, uh, there's, there's just a lot of opportunity for, for more storytelling and, and character development. So that's exciting. Agreed. Yeah. I'd love to see a ready player one TV show. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, well, Hugh, thanks so much for coming and sharing with us and, and, uh, just, allowing us to hear your journey. And it, there's just so many things in this conversation that were encouraging. And I think you're going to bring a lot of hope to a lot of people and, uh, and, and motivation too. So thank you so much. And I'm excited for you and, and for your continued success. And it's just, it's really cool to see somebody that you followed for a while. And when I saw that first Apple TV trailer, I like texted Ben, I was like, dude, they're making a series. And then I, I hit you up on Twitter and you were gracious enough to, to come on here. And uh, and uh, so we really appreciate it. Yeah, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ben. And uh, safe travels to Costa Rica, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.